Let's think about how taxonomy is assigned to 16S sequences. There's a lot of confusion about my microbial taxonomy, even among, among experts. To make things clear, I'd like to go back to basics and remind you how taxonomy works. A human expert examines the phenotype of a living organism and either assigns it to an existing group or defines a new group. Groups are defined by characteristic traits. For example, mammals are warm-blooded and have fur. For a bacterial example, I'll take Salmonella. It has flagella. Its cells are from 2 to 5 micrometers long and from 0.7 to 1.5 micrometers in diameter. It's non-spore forming and gram-negative. Ne gram if a cell has these characteristic traits, it's Salmonella. Named groups are organized into a hierarchy which can be visualized as a tree. The goal of taxonomy is often described as designing a hierarchy which is useful and corresponds as closely as possible to the evolutionary tree. A taxonomic nomenclature is a standard for group names and their hierarchy. Unfortunately, in microbial taxonomy, there are several different nomenclatures in common use, including Berger's manual, the list of prokaryotic names with standings in nomenclature, the NCBI taxonomy database, and systems defined by sequence databases such as Silver, Green Genes, and Unite. Some differences between these nomenclatures arise from conflicts between traditional classifications and molecular sequence ev evidence. For example, Escherichia and Shigella have very similar 16S sequences, and these traditionally defined genera are not believed to be monophyletic. In other words, they're believed to, uh, to overlap in the true phylogenetic tree. Other differences between nomenclatures are due to new groups which are known only from sequence evidence and therefore cannot be assigned characteristic traits. However, these differences are not usually important in practice and all prokaryotic nomenclatures agree with Berge's manual on most groups. With most animals and plants, species are naturally defined as a group that can breed. With asexual organisms, this definition does not apply. Every cell division potentially creates a node in the phylogenetic tree as mutations are introduced, and the leaves may be very dense and close together. This raises the question of where to draw boundaries around species and other ranks in the taxonomic hierarchy. There are some guidelines about how to do this. For example, if two strains have more than 97% identity in their 16S gene sequences, then this is sometimes taken as indicating that they should belong to the same species. But the boundaries between species and strains are often arbitrary and problematic. Keep in mind that the 16S gene is only a tiny fraction of the genome, and two cells with similar or identical 16S sequences may have large differences in other genes. We can illustrate the problems with defining species and strains by considering the well-known bacterium E. coli. 16,000 gene families have been identi identified across all sequence strains, but only 6% of these are present in all strains, and a typical pair of strange, strains shares only around 60% of its genes. Therefore, this so-called species has high genetic diversity, which is reflected in functional differences between strains. For example, whether they're par uh, par pathogenic or benign, and in most cases, strains cannot be distinguished by their 16S sequence. There are many sequence databases with taxonomy annotations that we might use as a reference for determining the taxonomy of our 16S OTUs. To interpret these annotations, let's take a look at where they come from. Approximately 10,000 prokaryotic species have been studied and named by taxonomists 
which have been assigned to a little more than 2,000 genera. The number of genera known from sequence is much larger. Of course, the genus is not really defined until it's been studied by taxonomists, but we can estimate the number by clustering the silver database at 95% 16S identity, which gives around 100,000 clusters. Notice that most known sequences have no genus name. The total diversity of all extant prokaryotes prokaryo prokaryo is unknown. Some studies have claimed that half or more of the diversity is already known from 16S sequences, while others suggest that the total number of genera may be in the millions. With this background, it's now clear that taxonomy annotations can be divided into two main types. If the sequence came from a cultured strain, then we know the phenotype and the taxonomy is authoritative. Otherwise, the sequence came from an environmental sample and there's no information about the phenotype. In this case, the taxonomy must be predicted. Since only a small fraction of microbial species have been cultured and named, a large majority of taxonomy annotations must be predictions, and many of these must be for genera which have not been named. Such sequences may be quite diverged from known strains, making predictions difficult. This raises some questions. How are the taxonomy predictions made, and how accurate are they? Now we get into a big mess. In most databases, it's not documented which annotations are authoritative or how the predictions were generated. GenBank is a typical example. Taxonomy identifiers are assigned by the submitter and there's no provision in the database for noting if or how a prediction was generated. What about the big 16S databases? Silver and green genes use similar approaches for predicting taxonomy of environmental sequences. They construct a multiple alignment of all the sequences and use that alignment to make a tree. There are more than a million se sequences in these databases, so the alignments and trees are huge. With silver and green genes, the starting point for generating taxonomy annotations is a tree where a few leaves are cultured strains with known taxonomers and the others correspond to environmental sequences. Now we need an algorithm which propagates group names from cultured strains to the other leaves. For now, let's assume the tree is correct and ask if it's possible to make a reliable algorithm. Take a look at the blue cultured group. Which node is the lowest common ancestor? There are two possible lowest common ancestors for the blue group, shown here with numbers 1 and 2. Both of these are above all the blue nodes, and their subtrees don't include cultured sequences from any other group. If number 1 is the correct LCA, then three of the environmental sequences belong to the blue group, shown with red outlines. On the other hand, if number 2 is the correct LCA, then only one of the environmental sequences belongs to the blue group, and we can infer that we should add a new group, shown here in orange. This group does not have the characteristic traits of the blue group, but has not yet been studied or named by taxonomists. There's not enough information in the tree to distinguish whether node 1 or node, node 2 is the correct LCA, so a reliable algorithm based solely on the tree is not possible in principle even if the tree is correct. You might be wondering if the blue example was a typical case or a pathological exception. Actually, it's very typical. The difficulty, or rather impossibility, of figuring out the lowest common ancestor node is most obvious when there's only one sequence in a group. Singletons are very common. In fact, roughly half of all named genera are known only from a single cultured strain. If the tree is not sufficient, then the only other information available is sequence similarity, which is usually expressed as a percent identity. For example, we might choose to use the rule of thumb that if the identity is greater than 
then the sequences come from the same species. However, identity is an unreliable guide to taxonomy. Taxonomy predictions are uncertain, but silver and green genes do not give any indication of confidence. This causes a new problem. Suppose the curators of silver have a sequence they think is probably salmonella, but they're only 70% sure. What should they do? If they annotate the sequence as salmonella, then applying the strategy to all annotations could lead to 30% false positives. On the other hand, if they leave the genus blank, then they could have 70% false negatives. Keep in mind that a blank name can indicate a novel group or a named group where the confidence is too low to report. In practice, it's very challenging to make an alignment and tree of more than a million highly diverged sequences spanning a vast range of evolutionary time. And we should therefore worry that the silver and green genes trees are not very good. If a reliable tree-based algorithm is not possible in principle, and the tree is probably not very good, and sequence identity is used to help determine group boundaries, then we should also be very skeptical that the taxonomy annotations in silver and green genes are accurate. How can we check the accuracy of these annotations? The strategy I used is to compare the databases with each other. If they disagree on the ta taxonomy of an identical sequence, then at least one must be wrong. This follows logically because taxonomy is based on phenotypic traits, and these traits are either present or not, even if we haven't observed the phenotype. Here are the results. I found that silver and green genes disagree on 34% of taxonomy annotations for identical sequences. There are disagreements at all taxonomic ranks, including around 15% at class rank and 1% disagreements on the phylum. This is a lower bound on the total number of errors in silver and green genes combined because there are surely additional errors where the databases agree, but both are wrong. If we assume that the databases have similar error rates, then both of them have an error rate of at least 17%. If one is better than the other, then the error rate of the worst database must be even higher than 17%. The key message to remember here is that silver and green genes do not provide authoritative references for taxonomy. On the contrary, probably something like one in five of their taxonomy annotations is wrong. So why are there so many errors? I believe that the main problem is bad trees. As a typical example, here is the green gene subtree for genus Rhodobacter, including only cultured sequences with authoritative taxonomy. Rhodobacter sequences are shown by red circles with blue, yellow, green, and black for other genera. Lowest common ancestor nodes are shown as colored squares. This is the smallest subtree, which includes all cultured Rhodobacter strains. Ideally, each genus would be monophyletic. In other words, it would have its own subtree separate from other genera. But as you can see, the subtree for Rhodobacter includes strains from several other genera. This could be because taxonomists fail to recognize traits that correlate with phylogeny, but I think it's much more likely that the tree is bad in other words, has a quite different branching order from the true 16S gene tree. We can check this by comparing the green genes tree with the silver tree. If they agree on the main features of this subtree, this would suggest that both trees are good and the taxonomists pick bad traits. But that's not how it looks. Here are the green genes and silver subtrees for Rhodobacter uh, all together. As you can see, the branching orders are quite different. Notice, for example, that green genes includes three genera shown with black X's, which are missing from the silver subtree. 
In the silver tree, the two, the two Gemobacter strains shown in green are mono, monophyletic. But in the green genes tree, the Gemobacter strains are polyphyletic with Hemobacter shown in blue. These observations show that the silver and green genes trees conflict with authorita authoritative taxonomy and with each other. If we are to believe that one tree is accurate, then we have to believe that the tree, bu tree building method used, used by the other database is much worse. And also that microbial taxonomists have been doing a consistently bad job of selecting characteristic, tra uh, characteristic traits which are conserved by evolution it's much more reasonable to believe that both trees are bad. The RDP database uses a completely different approach. They have no multiple alignment or tree. Sequences are annotated using the naive Bayesian classifier algorithm. The classifier uses a reference database of cultured strains with authoritative taxonomy. Unlike silver and green genes, RDP provides the reference databases, which they call training sets. To test the RDP approach, I used the oldest training set I could find, version 9, to classify new sequences added between versions 9 and 16, which was the latest version when I did this work. <clears throat> to measure accuracy, I compared classifier predictions using the old reference with annotations in the new reference, which are known to be correct. Here are the results. The measured error rate on this test is around 15%. However, I believe the annotation error rate for the full RDP database is probably less than this because many of the sequences have high identity with cultured strains, which makes taxonomy prediction easier. You can read more about this work in the PRJ paper shown here.